Hey everyone, welcome back to Learn With Me. I'm Deborah Hansen, and today we're going to look at AP Psychology 1.6 Sensation, the key terms for that part of the unit. So if you want to know more about the CED questions and the essential knowledge, that's on a separate video where I go through each of the questions and some important information that you're going to need to know for the exam. So this one is simply the key terms, a definition and an example to help you with your flashcards, just so that you know the terms that you can apply them when it comes to exam day. So here we go. Okay, so we're going to start with the first CED question, explain how the process of sensation is related to behavior and mental processes. I'm not going to go through all seven in this one. I'm just going to go through the questions that have some important key terms that you need to know. Okay, so this is the list for the first question, and we're going to go through each word. We're going to say the definition and the example, and then at the end, I'm just going to flash the words on the screen so that you can try to remember what they are. Okay, this is a really good opportunity to put them in your notebook or make some flashcards. Okay, let's start with body position sense. Body position sense, also known as proprioception, is the ability to sense the position and movement of one's own body parts without visual input. So when you close your eyes and you touch your nose with your finger, you rely on your body position sense to know where your hand and nose are relative to each other. You might want to try that right now. Kinesthetic sense. Kinesthetic sense is the ability to perceive the position, movement, and actions of body parts, providing awareness of how different parts of the body are moving and interacting. So when you walk, your kinesthetic sense helps you adjust your steps and balance by sensing how your legs and feet move and how much force needs to apply to each step. Principles of sensation. So the definition for of sensation is that it's the process of detecting stimuli from the environment through our senses, like seeing, hearing, or touching. The principles of sensation involves how our senses detect detect and respond to that stimuli. So let's look at a few examples. We have thresholds, the minimum amount of stimulus needed to detect it, like hearing a really quiet sound. Sensory adaptation, that's getting used to a constant stimulus over time, like not noticing a smell after a while. Transduction, converting a sensory information into signals that the brain can understand, like light being turned into visual signals. And last one, selective attention, focusing on certain stimuli while ignoring others, like listening to one voice in a noisy room. Oops. So we're going to look at sensory adaptation. Sensory adaptation is the process by which our sensory receptors become less sensitive to constant or unchanging stimuli over time. So when you first put on a watch, you might be aware of the weight and feel like you can feel it on your wrist. However, after wearing it for a while, you no longer notice it as much because your sensory receptors adapt to the constant presence of your watch. Sensory habituation. Sensory habituation is the process by which our brain becomes less responsive to a stimulus after being exposed to it repeatedly or continuously. So if you live near a train track, at first you might find the sound of the train really annoying. It'll be really disruptive. However, over time, you become less aware of that sound and no longer bothers you anymore as much as your brain has become habituated to it. Sensory transduction. Sensory transduction is the process by which sensory receptors convert physical stimuli, like light, sound, or touch, into electrical signals that the brain can understand. So when you touch a hot stove, the heat is detected by the sensory receptors in your skin. These receptors convert the heat into electrical signals, which are then sent to your brain, where you receive the sensation of heat and feel pain. Sensory interaction. Sensory interaction refers to the principle that one sense may influence another and that the senses work together to create our perception of the world. So when you eat, the taste of the food can be influenced by its smell. For instance, if you have a cold and your sense of smell is impaired, food might taste bland because the sensory interaction between taste and smell is reduced. Signal detection theory. The signal detection theory is a framework used to determine how well someone can detect a signal or stimulus amidst background noise, considering both their sensitivity and their decision criteria. So imagine you're at a noisy party trying to hear your friend's voice. Signal detection theory helps explain how you can distinguish your friend's voice, the signal, from the background noise of the party. Your ability to detect their voice depends on how loudly they speak, that's their signal strength, and how well you can focus on their voice despite the noise, your sensitivity and decision criteria. 
embodied cognition. Embodied cognition is the theory that cognitive processes are deeply rooted in the body's interactions within the world, suggesting that the mind is influenced by the body's physical state and action. When holding a warm cup of coffee, people are more likely to perceive others as having warm personalities. This illustrates how physical sensations can influence social judgment, judgments and perceptions. Synesthesia. Synesthesia is a condition in which one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to automatic involuntary experiences in a second sensory or cognitive pathway. So a person with synesthesia might see a specific colors when they hear certain sounds, such as seeing the color blue whenever they hear the note C on a piano. Another example of synesthesia is grapheme color synesthesia, where individuals perceive specific letters or numbers as inherently colored. So for instance, someone might always see the number five as green and, as the, and the letter A as red, regardless of the actual color of the text. Vestibular sets. The vestibular sense is a sensory system that helps us maintain balance and spatial orientation by detecting changes in head movement and position. So when you spin around in a circle and then you stop, your vestibular sense, your vestibular sense helps you feel disoriented initially, but quickly adjusts to stabilize your balance. This system, located in your inner ear, detects the movement and helps you keep your balance and know which way you're oriented. Weber's Law Weber's law states that the smallest detectable difference in stimulus intensity, that's your just noticeable difference, is proportional to the initial intensity of the stimulus. Here's an example. If you're holding a light weight, for example, five pounds, and someone adds another small weight, example, another half pound, you might notice the difference. However, if you're holding a heavier weight, like 50 pounds, and the same small weight is added, you might not notice the difference as easily. According to Weber's law, the amount of change needed to detect a difference depends on the initial weight. So pause the video after each word so that you can see if you can come up with the definition and example for each one, okay? Body position sense, kinesthetic sense, principles of sensation, sensory adaptation, sensory habituation, Sensory transduction, signal detection theory, vestibular sense, Weber's law, synesthesia, sensation interaction, embodied cognition. Now let's look at TED question number two, explain how the structures and functions of the visual sensory system relate to behavior and mental processes. We're just gonna look at a few words for this section and I'll give you the definition and example like last time. Amplitude. Amplitude is the height or strength of a wave, such as a sound or light wave. It determines the intensity or loudness of the sound and the brightness of light. A, light, a loud sound has a high amplitude while a quiet sound has a low amplitude. Electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is the range of all types of light waves, including visible light, radio waves, and x-rays. Visible light is just a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which also includes invisible waves, like the ones used in microwaves and x-ray machines. Hue. Hue is the basic color we see, like red, blue, or yellow. The hue of a ripe tomato is red. Intensity. Intensity refers to the brightness or strength of something, like a light or sound. A flashlight on its brightest setting has a high intensity, while on a dim setting has a low intensity. Visible light spectrum. The visible light spectrum is the range of light waves that humans can see, which include all the colors from red to violet. A rainbow shows the visible light spectrum with, with colors like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And if you remember from your old science classes, that would be your Roy G. Biv. Wavelength. Wavelength is the distance between two peaks of a wave, like in light or sound waves. It determines the color or of light and the pitch of sound. So in light, a short wavelength gives you blue or violet colors, while a long wavelength gives you red. Okay, we're going to go through the same thing as we did last time. I'm just going to say them, pause between each word, see if you can come up with a definition and example. Amplitude. Electromagnetic spectrum. Hue. Intensity, 
visible light spectrum. Wavelength. Next up, CED question number three. Explain how the structures and functions of the auditory sensory system relate to behavior and mental processes. Okay, so these are going to be the key terms we're going to look at, definition and example. Okay, we're going to start with the pina. The pina is the outer part of the ear that you can see. It helps to collect and direct sound into the ear. So when you cup your hand around your ear to hear someone better, you're using your pina to focus more sound into your ear canal. Ear canal. The ear canal is the tube that leads the sound from the outer ear, the pina, to the eardrum. So when sound enters your ear, it travels through the ear canal to reach the eardrum where it starts the process of hearing. Eardrum. The eardrum is a thin membrane in the ear that vibrates when sound waves hit it, starting the process of hearing. When you hear a loud noise, the sound waves cause your eardrum to vibrate, which helps send the sig sound signals to your brain. Ossicles. The ossicles are three tiny bones in the middle ear that help carry sound vibrations from the eardrum to the inner ear. When sound waves cause the eardrum to vibrate, the ossicles move and transmit these vibrations to the inner ear, where they're processed as sound. Cochlea. The cochlea is a spiral-shaped part of the inner ear that converts sound vibrations into electrical signals for the brain. When the sound vibrations reach the cochlea, it turns them into signals that your brain interprets as different sounds, like music or speech. Auditory nerves. The auditory nerves are the nerves that carry sound signals from the cochlea in the inner ear to the brain. After the cochlea converts the sound into signals, the auditory nerves send these signals to your brain so you can understand what you're hearing. Place theory. Place theory is the idea that different parts of the cochlea respond to different frequencies of sound, helping us hear different pitches. According to place theory, high-pitched sounds make the part of the cochlea closer to the bass vibrate, while low-pitched sounds make the part closer to the tip vibrate. Frequency theory. Frequency theory is the idea that the rate at which the auditory nerves fire matches the frequency of a sound, helping us hear different pitches. According to frequency theory, if you hear a low pitch sound, the auditory nerves fire at a slower rate, while a high pitch sound fires at a faster one. Volley theory. The volley theory is the idea that groups of neurons work together to fire in rapid succession, helping to detect higher frequencies of sound. So when you hear a high frequency sound, like a whistle, different groups of auditory neurons fire in quick succession to, help, to keep up with that fast frequency. Okay, now let's practice. Okay, so we're going to go through the words and you're going to see if you can know the definition and an example. Pina. Ear canal. Eardrum, ossicles, cochlea, auditory nerves, frequency theory, volley theory. Now for the last question that we're going to look at, this is number six from the CED, explain how the structures and functions of the pain sensory system relate to behavior and mental processes. For this one, we're only going to go through three key terms. There are a lot more definitions and things in that longer video where I go through everything that you need to know, the essential knowledge and stuff. So, but we're just going to look at these three for now. So we're going to start with nociceptors. Nociceptors are specialized nerve endings that detect pain. They respond to harmful stimuli like extreme heat, cold, or injury. So if you accidentally touch a hot stove, the nociceptors in your skin send a pain signal to your brain, alerting you to pull your hand away quickly. The next one is the gate control theory. The gate control theory suggests that the spinal cord has a gate that can control whether pain signals, the pain signals reach the brain. So when the gates open, we feel pain. When the gates closed, the pain is blocked or reduced. So rubbing a sore spot can help reduce the pain because it closes the gate by sending other signals to the brain, blocking some of the pain messages. And the last one, phantom limb sensation. The phantom limb sensation is when someone who's lost a limb still feels like it's there, often experiencing sensation, sensations like itching, tingling, or pain. So a person who has had their leg amputated might still feel as if their toes are moving or hurting, even though the, the leg is no longer there. Okay, let's practice. No susceptors. Gate control theory. Phantom limb sensation. 
And that's all the key terms for 1.6 sensation. So like I said, you can watch the other video where we go into a lot more detail, but it's really important to understand the key terms so that you can apply them when you get to your, your unit tests or your final exam. If you really like the content today, please like and subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. See you next time.